Okay, so <clears throat> during the last class, uh, we introduced uh, kernels, images, and exact sequences for uh, vector bundles. And we played a bit with this new concept. And in particular, we discussed the canonical bundle of a manifold. And we also related the canonical bundle of a sub-manifold with the canonical bundle of the old manifold. Okay, uh, using the concept of divisors, which we also introduced last time. Uh, in all of this, I mentioned that uh, if you take two linear, uh, sorry, line uh, bundles, so that is complex holomorphic line bundles of rank one, you can take the tensor product within them. And this should give us uh, an operation and a group. So today we'll actually discuss this group. So line bundles and the Picard group. So today M will be a complex manifold always. And all our bundles will be holomorphic bundles. So holomorphic vector bundle. So we already said this, but we never wrote it down. So let's write down of rank one on M on M is a line bundle. Okay, so line bundles are this rank one vector bundles. And the set, so for now it's just a set of all such bundles over M. up to equivalence, so maybe not up to equivalence, but modulo equivalence, is the Picard group. Of M denoted by Okay, so for now, this is just a set. You take not really all possible line bundles and that's it. You take all possible line bundles modulo equivalent. So if two vector, if two line bundles are equivalent and equivalent means an equivalence of vector bundles, holomorphic vector bundles, uh, then you say that they're the same object in this Picard group. Proposition. So we call this group, uh, even if for now it's just a set, the modular relationship. And so the proposition here is that pick M is an abelian group uh, with respect to a tensor product. And uh, the inverse of a line bundle is the dual of the line bundle and the neutral element is the trivial bundle, so M times C, okay? So proof is pretty short. So, okay, we know that L tensor L prime, it's isomorphic as vector bundles to L prime tensor L, so this we know. Uh, it's true in general, but for uh, rank one, it's even easier because you just have to look at the transition function. The transition functions for this is just the product of the two transition functions and the same here and product of a complex number is community. And we also know, we check this uh, another time, that this is also isomorphic to this trivial bundle. And we also know that M times C tensor L is isomorphic to L. Yeah. So this is, oh, sorry, this is tensor. 
Um, so these are things actually we've seen before, uh, but now we just rewrite them thinking that this uh, tensor product is an operation. Okay. Um, so there is only one thing I want to say about this thing. So this is the bigger group. That's it. It's a group. Um, but I want to discuss a bit more on how this modulo equivalent looks like if you really look at it via the transition functions. So we look at a tiny spoiler of things that will come in the future. So we consider tau m. So normally tau m, you would think of this as like the topology on m, the, the all possible open set. Uh, but instead now is the um, let that be, not to be. Let be the set of all coverings, um, coverings u alpha of u m together with functions g alpha beta from the intersections into C star. C star would be GL one C satisfying cocycle identities. So this tau m, an element of tau m is made of a covering and of transition functions, basically. So we know that every element here uh, determines uh, a line bundle and vice versa. So observation. Um, a set of u alpha, g alpha, beta. Maybe I should write like this. So. A pair of collections, yeah, in tau m uh, defines a line bundle and vice versa. So a line bundle defines an element of this tau m. Okay. Um, and now I want to see when two such. So basically, we can think that these are the line bundles, or their data of the line bundle that determine a line bundle uniquely. And I want to see here what this equivalence relation looks like. Okay. So I want to know when I given two data like this, uh, when do they define two line bundles which are equivalent? So after passing to a common refinement, so this means that we can assume that this covering is the same covering for the two <clears throat> objects, two line bundles with transition functions g alpha beta and h alpha beta are isomorphic if and only if there exists the f alphas such that f beta is h beta alpha f alpha g alpha beta on u alpha intersected u beta. So this is uh, not something I'm pulling out of a hat. This is something we have seen where we were discussing isomorphism of vector bundles. Um, this is true for all vector bundles. That's why I wrote it like this. So here you don't have to think that this is in C star. You can think this is in GLN for now. Like, uh, And this would be a product of matrices. So we already saw that this is when, when two bundles are equivalent, this must happen. And in our specific case, so now we really use the fact that we're in dimension one, this is the same as saying that F beta over F alpha is G alpha beta over uh, H alpha beta. And notice that H beta alpha is one over H alpha beta. Okay. 
So if we use this as our equivalence relationship, we see that the Picard group of M is basically this tau M model of this relationship. And why did I say that this is a spoiler of something that will come in the future? Um, they, they, the, I mean, I'm just gonna hand wave a lot here because uh, this is in fact uh, some good month and a half of theory before we get there. Uh, but the idea that here's uh, just some objects which are defined by two indices. And this in the, the fact that there is two indices means that we are on an intersection. And here was something which is on one index. And this thing here is telling you when objects with two indices are equivalent in terms of objects with one index. So you can kind of think of this as some form of differential in the sense. Uh, think of uh, one forms. So I'm, I'm just going to talk about this. Uh, so think of one forms and you say the two one forms are equivalent if their difference is exact, right? So this is the cohomology. And this is similar to that. Is that you have some higher order term. So you can think of this as like two forms are equivalent if they satisfy something in terms of one forms. Uh, in fact, so the, the spoiler here is that we will use a similar concept to build a cohomology. Cohomology, whatever that is. We, I mean, we only know the RAM cohomology for now. Uh, but in principle, you can build all kinds of cohomologies. So, whatever that is. Yeah, we, we don't know what's a cohomology in general. Uh, but yeah, I just want to point out this fact that you can think of this as like two form in relationship with one form. Okay, so now we know what is this speaker group. And um, now it's time to compute one of these Picard groups. And in particular, we will deal with the Picard group of CPM, so the um, projective complex space. So um, to talk about Picard group, the first thing we need is a line bundle, which is not trivial. So we know we need to start somewhere. So there is this very famous example of a um, line bundle over CPN. So the tau to logical bundle over CPN is O negative one, if you put it like this. So O like holomorphic and negative one inside. And you take it as a subset of uh, the trivial bundle of dimension CM plus one, of rank CM plus one. Okay, so let's see what this means. So we have this trivial bundle of ranks uh, n plus one, but we don't take all of it because we want a line bundle. So the projection is of course the projection on the first component and over every point, you take all the Vs which are determined by the line passing through P. This is the CP is uniquely de determined because, uh, of course, this is an equivalence class. Uh, so you kind of basically just look at the anti image of P for the pro projection that defines CPN and you take that. So the name comes, uh, the name comes. that 
the fiber over P is the line passing through P and zero in CN plus one. Okay. So this is for now, this is just uh, uh, a projection. No, we're projecting this PN and every fiber is a vector space. This is not the same as being a vector bundle. So let's check that. We need to actually give three realizations. So the standard uh, open sets here, standard coverings in CPN are this ones. U alpha is where the alpha component is non zero. Uh, then in this coordinate chart, we have deterioration. We send the zero, the n, comma, v zero, the n. So this is an element of CN plus one into, okay, the first one is to stay the same, of course. Well, the second one is simply V alpha. So we have to prove that this is an uh, isomorphism, right? Um, so to prove that it is an isomorphism, Let's find the inverse. Because of course, if you have an inverse, I mean, this is clearly linear. Um, so if you have an inverse, which is also linear, then you have an isomorphism. So if P is Z0 comma, comma Zn, and V is in CP, Uh, if and only if there is some complex number such that vj is lambda zj for every j from 0 to n. Right? This is simply, no, v is in cp, so there is such lambda. Right? And in particular, on u alpha, we get that uh, uh, this lambda is precisely v alpha over z alpha. Why only on u alpha? Well, because to divide, we need this to be non zero, right? So now what we expect would be a good definition for our inverse. Is to send our point uh, z0, zn, comma, lambda alpha. Here, okay, this has to be the same. So z0, zn, comma, lambda alpha over z alpha, and z0, comma. Okay, so let's verify that this is in fact the inverse. Uh, let's just do it by i. Uh, so let's say that we start from here, we go on to v alpha, um, and then when you. Okay, so first of all, maybe we should check that it's well defined. No, yeah, that is well defined. Sorry, maybe we should check it well defined first. Uh, but that is well defined, it's clear. Because here, if you, this is an equivalence class, and if you multiply this by some, well, not lambda, but some mu, then they simplify. And for the fact that this is the inverse, well, um, okay, you send this V0, Vn to V alpha, and then you send V alpha back to V alpha divided itself times V, right here, okay? Or if you change it here, of course, this also changes accordingly, so it doesn't change. Uh, 
uh, vice versa. Yeah, sorry, I know I'm a bit hand waving here. Um, yeah, vice versa, you have this reconstruction. You have to use this part here. Okay, but yeah, I'm a bit hand waving, of course. Uh, but it's not hard to check. Uh, in particular, we will now not really check, but we will find the transition functions. So now we have, you know, um, trivializations, and we have the inverse trivialization. So to really check that it's a vector bundle, we need to check that the transition functions are linear. So we take a point in the intersection. And we compute phi alpha composed phi beta inverse of d0, zn, comma, lambda beta. OK, so we apply the first term. OK, here we get this again. And here we have this ratio. And now we apply phi alpha. So again, you get this first thing. And this, uh, you simply have to look at the zeta alpha component here. So you get lambda beta times zeta alpha divided by zeta. So we do, in fact, have a line bundle, because uh, this is a linear map. And in particular, we get the, the this linear map, this transition function. Sorry, zeta n is zeta alpha over zeta beta. So this is to go from beta to alpha, from beta to alpha. Um, so now we have a line bundle. So this, what is it? This O negative one is the so-called tautological bundle, and we verify that it is indeed a line bundle. And now we can produce other line bundles. So one common thing to do is to define O one as the inverse of O negative one, so or the dual. And now we can also take products. So OK can be just the tensor product of K times O1. When K is greater than 0, we can also take the tensor product of K of negative K times negative 1. when k is less than 0. Or we can simply take trivial bundle when k is equal to 0. OK? So this is, I mean, it's something you always do for groups. So you find, an, I mean, you know that something is a group. You find an element of it. And then you can just take this this element times itself a lot of times. You can take its inverse and take that. So you take the group generated by this line bundle. And um, for now, it looks a lot like z, right? z as in integers. Uh, but one thing we do not know is that all these bundles are actually different. Uh, in principle, it could be that after, I don't know, n times that you do this, you go back to the trivial bundle. Uh, but let's give some observations first. So the transition functions for these bundles, well, we know the ones for the generator is z alpha over z beta. So this is simply going to be z alpha over z beta uh, to the negative k. Yeah, because the minus 1 corresponds to z alpha over z beta. OK, so think for k equal negative 1, we have z alpha over z beta. Then if you take this times itself, you're simply multiplying the two transition functions. So you get to the sec, to squared, 
in the third and the fourth. And if you take the inverse, you know that the transition function of the inverse is the inverse of the transition function. Uh, so you can get this nice. Okay, is this part clear? And this also actually gives us another observation. And now that we know is that you, if you take the product of two of them, OK and OM, uh, this is isomorphic to OK plus M for every K and M and Z. Uh, this again, because you simply multiply this to transition functions, and what you're doing is simply adding the exponents. Okay, so this gives us some kind of uh, subgroup which really looks like Z. It's not only indexed by Z, but also the operation looks like the sum in Z. Um, before we continue, uh, you know, we discussed the other time how every time you have a sub-manifold, uh, this gives this is a divisor, and in particular it gives rise to a um, line bundle. So sub-manifold of codimension one gives rise to sub-bundles. So let's see what happens when we take H in CPN uh, a projective hyperplane. So what is a projective hyperplane? It's just something which so such that uh, which in coordinates looks like plane or an hyperplane. Uh, this, if we put equal to zero, so if we have this homogeneous equation, uh, this is well defined, yeah, because um, it's homogeneous. And alpha is just some element of Cn plus one minus zero. So H is a codimension one submanifold. So it gives a Cartier divisor. which we call like this. Okay, how do we actually, and we know that the Cartier divisor gives rise to a bundle, and how do we find this bundle? Well, on U alpha, the local description f alpha equals zero is given by f alpha of z0 over zeta alpha. And here, remember, we skip zeta alpha, comma, comma, zeta anna over zeta alpha. Well, this is simply the same thing. So you take a0 and z0 over zeta alpha plus, plus a n z n over zeta alpha. Right, so if you look just on U alpha and you think of it as a coordinate chart, uh, this looks like CN. We saw it when we defined the uh, projective space. And it looks like this. And here, careful, here you don't have to, don't, don't, so here I'm, I'm skipping that alpha, right, because that's how it's defined. But here you don't skip A alpha. Z alpha over Z alpha. Here you, do, you have to not skip it. Okay? So it's basically when you're looking at this equation here, you're simply dividing this equation by Z alpha to, to find this new trivial, to find what H looks like in this trivialization. Okay? And so when you, when you divide by Z alpha, you're simply left with this A alpha. This, this, one, this, this one is, of course, just one, but A alpha stays there. So 
movement is not homogeneous anymore. Uh, my thing that is good for us here is that if you take F alpha over F beta on the intersection, well, F alpha is basically dividing by Z alpha, right? Uh, so this is going to be simply Z beta over Z alpha times some U and U is never zero. So f alpha, you're basically taking this function here, this homogeneous function, and divide it by zeta alpha. And f beta is the same. So you're left with this time some function, which is not zero. Um, so now we know what is the associated transition functions for the line bundle defined by the Cartier divisor. And this is zeta beta over zeta alpha which are nothing but the transition functions of O1. So we know that if we have the same transition functions, we are isomorphic. Okay. Uh, so this again, um, you know, if you want to study this Picard group of the, the uh, complex projective space, we just need to produce bundles. And the way we know to produce bundle, well, this Cartier divisor thing is a way that we know how to produce bundles. So we did. And it turns out it's just the one of the powers of this uh, tautological bundle. Okay, um, so now we want to show that all of this are actually different. And the way we will do this is by looking at their uh, global sections. Okay, so if to, yeah. Yeah, just one question. Uh, with the last thing we did, uh, did we just uh, show that there are no, um, no elements in the PK group that would not be, um, uh, a multiple of of the um, canonical bundle. Of the uh, canonical bundle. Uh, no, that's not tautological. the canonical. Tautological. Yeah, it's the wrong name. Uh, why? Um, so I thought uh, we just uh, show uh, showed that um, for any hyperplane we take, um, it is some power of the uh, tautological. Not some power. The, if we take an hyperplane, it's. Yeah, it's the negative one power. Yeah, it's this one. Mm. Yeah, okay. Mm, no, well, we're, we're very mm. close to that, but no, because uh, remember that uh, we need to prove it not just for hyperplane, but for every submanifold of condimension one. Ah, yeah, okay. Because remember, a Cartier divisor was the same as having a submanifold of condimension one. Okay. So here we're just taking hyperplanes. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh... <laughs> I'll be patient. <laughs> um, okay, so now the thing I want to discuss is uh, uh, global sections of this O case. Because uh, of course, if you have two bundles which are equivalent, then their space of global sections need to be isomorphic. Uh, and we will show that this is not the case. So proposition. the space of global sections of OK, which remember we denote it like this, is trivial for k less than zero, while it's uh, the homogeneous polynomials of degree k in n plus one variables for k or equal to zero. So let's say the, the higher the K, 
the more sections we have, global sections we have. Okay, so let's prove it. Uh, let's take a section. And let's look at its uh, local data. B, it's local data. Okay, so here I wrote you alpha, I'm just thinking of it as CM. And on the intersection, we have that S alpha, and the point is zero over Z alpha, comma, you skip Z alpha, comma, Zn over Z alpha. It's the same as, and we just put the transition function here for OK. And here we have Z zero over Z beta, comma, comma, you skip Z beta. Zn. Okay, this is just the definition of uh, local data. And now let's put everything which regards alpha on one side and everything which regards beta on the other side. Skip beta. Okay. And uh, this, this is true where? Where is this true? Oh, that's important. Uh, well, in principle, this is true on. Uh, so, in principle, this is true on u alpha intersect the u beta, right? Uh, but the left hand side, left hand side is actually a holomorphic where where z alpha is non-zero, right? Because we have this thing here. So this is holomorphic on Cn plus one minus z alpha equals zero. Well this side is holomorphic on Cn plus one minus Z beta equals zero. In particular, they are the same on the, so we have two holomorphic functions defined on open subset of Cn plus one, which are equal on the intersection. So they're equal on an open set. Uh, so this means that they extend each other. Uh, so this is basically, I don't know if you've ever seen this, so you've probably seen it in one variable, that if you have two holomorphic functions, which are the same on an open set, then they are the same wherever they're defined. And this is called identity principle. Uh, this identity principle is also true uh, in more variables. So if you have two holomorphic functions, which are the same on an open set, then they are the same wherever they're defined. Okay. Uh, so this is telling us that they're the same everywhere. So the nice thing here is that this expression, z alpha to the k times s alpha, is independent of alpha. So let P of Z be Z alpha to the K times S alpha, Z zero over Z alpha, comma, Z alpha skipped. Depends on the alpha. And this is independent of alpha. So it really depends only on the section. It only depends on S. 
okay? And now we see that this is a homogeneous polynomial. Because if you take P of lambda Z for lambda in C, well, this is lambda to the K, as you get it from outside, but inside everything simplifies. Because it's lambda to the K times uh, P, obviously. So P is homogeneous of degree K. And uh, you see, so far we didn't we didn't even say that K had to be positive. We still didn't get to the fact that K has to be positive. Uh, but the point is that P, um, I mean, now we have some function, some holomorphic function, which is homogeneous of degree k, and so k has to be positive, unless p is just zero. Okay. So uh, now we see that every time we have a section, this gives a uniquely determined the homogeneous polynomial of degree k. What about vice versa? Well, vice versa is pretty obvious in the sense that you start with such a polynomial. And then, yeah, then we have to define this local data, right? And show that they glue to a section. Well, but now there is basically just one way to do it. Uh, so you define, uh, sorry, alpha skipped well you have to define it like this right here we put a one on the alpha position So we define it like this. And this kind of makes sense uh, because if you think of this lambda to be this z alpha, it's like putting this inside. And um, so p is homogeneous, which is very good, uh, because then s alpha is nothing but g alpha beta ok times s beta. Do you see it? So this G alpha beta OK is, uh, where is it? Yeah, Z alpha over Z beta to the negative K. So let's think about it as Z beta over Z alpha to the K. So think that inside here we have Z beta over Z alpha and we bring it out. So this gives us this. But what is left inside? Well, we're basically substituting this Z alpha that was in the denominator with Z beta. So that's S beta. Not convinced? You wanna do it? Convinced? Okay. Uh, so in particular, this uh, glue to a section of O. Okay. And that's it. Um, so okay, corollary which is the thing, the old reason we did this, is that these two are isomorphic if and only if m is equal to k. And now you might say, oh, of course, it's obvious because uh, you know they need to have the same uh, set of global sections. So we, we know that they're different. If k is different than m, they're different. Well, the thing we don't know um, we don't know though what, what happens when k is negative. So if they were both positive, with one positive and one negative, you're done because the uh, sections are different. But what if they were both negative? Um, so let's assume that m is less than k. 
and we do OM tensor O negative K. And we know that this is isomorphic to O M minus K. Now this is uh, o, M, uh, M minus K is um, negative. Yeah, because M was smaller than K. So O M minus K admits only the zero section. But we said that OM is isomorphic to OK, right? This is the hypothesis. Of course, we're only proving this direction because this is obvious. Uh, so if we take OM tensor O negative K, and remember O negative K is the inverse of OK, this should be the trivial bundle, or at least isomorphic to it. Yeah. But now the trivial bundles as all constant, the all the constants are sections. So basically, I mean, instead of doing the whole things case by case, positive, negative, you just do it like this. Okay, so now that we have this uh, vector bundles, and we have quite a lot of them, we can play with them. And, um, our favorite way to play with bundles is to use exact sequences. So now we introduce the so-called Euler exact sequence. And the theorem is that the following sequence is exact. So we have zero, it's a short exact sequence, O negative one, embeds into cpn times cn plus one and this is just the embedding given by the fact that this is a subset and here we have a map which we call r into the tangent bundle of cpn tensor o minus one into zero and i have to tell you what this r is or is of V comma A so it's a map from here to here it is defined as the differential of pi at V of A tensor the pair V V and what is this D pi? where d pi v from t actually sorry i should have yeah v is good actually t c n plus one minus zero which we know is um, at v this, which is just the framework to cn plus one into tcpn is the differential of just the projection map. So this is like this, huh? so it's the tangent space to cpn cn minus one cn plus one minus zero. It's not tangent space minus zero, but it's the tangent of space minus zero. Okay. okay, so let's look at this for a second. So I think the only mysterious part about this is this differential. 
so we know we have this map, which is just the projection that defines CPN, right? You send an element to its equivalence class. And um, so you can take the differential of this map at a point B, yeah, a point in CN uh, plus one minus zero. You can take the differential. And if you identify this tangent space, which is CN plus one, you can see this as a map from CN plus one into TCPN. This is what we're doing. So you fix V and D pi is a map from uh, CN plus one to uh, TCPN, okay? And the second part is just a tautological bundle, so this is well defined. One thing we should be careful of is that here we have the equivalence class of V. Well, here we have V, right? In fact, this map alone, D pi V alpha A, is not well defined. But when you tensor it, it is. So let's see that. So proof. So first of all, let's let's forget this for a moment. So we will have to prove that R is actually well defined. Uh, but first, let's prove that t pi v is surjective and that its kernel is precisely uh, the line cv. Okay, so we just verify it on a local chart. Let's say u0, so it's easier. And then we simply have that p of v in that local chart is simply v1 over v0, comma, comma, vn over v0. Yeah, so here again, I'm abusing notation, which is something I hope uh, you're getting used to. Uh, here, I shouldn't put this. I should put the, um, what, the inverse trivialization of this, right? But we always say that this is the same thing. And now we simply compute the differential. And the differential is going to be a n times n matrix. And it's just the matrix of the gradients. So first of all, we have to derive this object with respect to v0. And you get negative v1 over v0 squared. Derivative with respect to v1, you get 1 over v0. Yes, and then you get zeros all the ways. Uh, here is similar, you get negative v2 over v0 squared. This is zero, uh, but then here on this like, let's call it the upper diagonal. Am I lying to you? I'm not, right? I'm not. And then zeros all the way. And if you continue, in the end, you get negative Vn over V0 squared, then all zeros, and in the last one is 1 over V0. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now it's easy to see that uh, if you... Um, well, first of all, this has uh, rank... Uh, um, So this is from Cn to so these are n times n plus one matrix. Yeah. And if you apply v to it, uh, you see that you get zero. Oh, maybe. Mm, can I copy this to bring it on the next page? Seems I cannot. No, I can only move it within the page. That's a bit sad. Okay, let's just down write it again. Sorry. Okay, D P V is the negative V one over V zero squared, negative V two 
will be zero squared all the way to negative vm will be zero squared. And here we have one over v zero, one over v zero, one over zero, zeros, 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 zeros. Okay, so we have um, n rows and n plus one columns. Yeah. And since it's, you have this diagonal here, so in particular, this is a minor, uh, n times n minor, which is diagonal and non zero. So the rank of this matrix is n, so the kernel is dimension one. So the rank d pi v equal n. Uh, so kernel, so the dimension of the kernel of d pi v is one. So we just need to find one vector in it. And the promise was that this is equal to zero. And you see, you're simply multiplying um, v zero here and this times v one. So let's do the multiplication here you have negative uh, v1 over v0, you're multiplying this times v0, then you multiply this time v1, and then you have zeros. This is the first row, right? It's just a matrix multiplication. Then we multiply this times v0, so you have negative v2 over v0, plus 0, plus v2 over v0, plus 0. So you just get zeros on the way. Um, so the kernel of DPV is precisely CV, as we said before. So that was part of this claim here. And surjectivity we also check, okay? Just simply because he has a rank to end. And you also see, so okay, this was uh, just one issue, show this one sub issue, but I was saying before this, I mean, this D pi V is well defined, but not if your input is just the equivalence class of v. Okay. Uh, so one thing I want to do is check what happens if you do d pi of lambda v. So if you change your representative, and you see that you're simply multiplying each element here by one over lambda. If you look at it. This is, so each term is like homogeneous of degree negative one. So this is one over lambda v dv. Okay. Now it's time to prove that um, this is well defined. So, okay, this was the definition. Uh, but let's see what happens if we take a different representative. So, let's say like this. So this is one over lambda, because we said that before. Tensor, and this is lambda v, but it's the same as v because it's the equivalence class, and this is lambda v. And remember, when we take the tensor product, uh, we're looking at the vector space part, so these two lambdas cancel out. So you can take this lambda out, let's say, because it's tensor product. And so one over lambda, lambda cancel out, and this is well defined. Okay. Uh, so an exercise. I'll leave you to check that this is actually a morphism of vector bundles. So you have to check that it's, it is indeed a morphism of vector bundles. So it's like uh, linear on the fibers and blah, blah, blah. And that it's subjective and such. And um, yeah, now to, to check that this is an exact sequence, we just have to look at the kernel of R over a particular point. 
so the kernel of R V. Uh, you see that on the right component, this is never zero. So the only kernel comes from here. So this is the same as the kernel of V by V. Uh, but we know we checked that this is C uh, V. And therefore, this is just the same as this one. So what we proved is that this exact this sequence is exact. So if you look at this map, which looks somewhat artificial, and in fact you do have this kind of magic that this tensor product simplifies this choice, um, it gives you that the kernel of this map is precisely O and negative one, which is a bit surprising perhaps. And okay, so now we have an exact sequence and we can do things with it. So, okay, we started with zero, negative one, uh, CPM times CN plus one. And here we have uh, TCPN tensor O n minus one zero. Okay, first of all, multiply by O one. Sorry, O one. And what do we get? The first term becomes the trivial bundle of, of rank one. Uh, the second term is just this thing. And here, uh, these two simplify, so this is simply T, C, T, N. Okay. Uh, now dualize. And remember, when we dualize, things change direction. Oh, of course, um, maybe I should say, why are we doing all of this? Well, usually the idea is to get some information about the um, canonical bundle of CPN. Right? So I'm looking to get something where only T star CPN appears and then use the determinant formula for exact sequences. So. That's why I'm multiplying, that's why I'm dualizing. So multiplying is to get rid of this part and dualizing is to get the star. Okay. So okay, we start here. This part stays the same because it's uh, just a trivial bundle. Uh, well, this part becomes O negative one. And this one also stays trivial. So this is exact now. And now we can uh, use the determinant formula. It tells you the determinant of the middle one is the product of the determinant of the outer ones. Okay, but now um, this is trivial. So this is, was already a, a bundle of rank one and the transition function was just, let's say the function identically one. So the determinant was just the function identically one. So it doesn't do anything in this product. It's just the neutral element of the group. This one is what we're interested in. This is uh, the canonical bundle of CPN, right? And this one, well, this one, we have to look at it. Um, so what are the transition functions for this bundle? Well, this is very easy because the transition functions for the um, first component, for the first part, for, for this trivial bundle, it's simply the identity map, right? It's the, it's the n plus one times n plus one identity matrix. Wait, times. Oh, negative one. And you know that when we do this uh, tensor product, you're taking this Cauchy product of the matrices, right? If you remember. 
Uh, but but here we have something which is just dimension one. So you're simply saying that the transition function for this bundle is the diagonal matrix, diagonal matrix, which on the diagonal has the same element, which is the transition function of O n minus one. So maybe I'll write this down. So the transition function here is just G alpha beta G alpha beta of O negative one all the way. So these are the transition functions for this uh, tensor bundle. This is m plus one times m plus one. Okay, because it's just the identity matrix times this one. And this is just a number, so it's like this. So if you take the determinant, well, this is very easy because this is nothing but uh, G alpha beta. This is a diagonal matrix to O negative one to the K, which is simply uh, sorry, oh, I should write this. This should have been at the bottom. So this is the determinant of this, and this is G alpha beta O negative one to the K. So this bundle here, it's simply O uh, to the negative K. A negative, what's K? Not K, N minus one, sorry, N plus one. because the dimension is n plus one. Okay. So the canonical bundle of CPN is uh, O of negative n plus one. So now it's time to get to your question. And we take a submanifold of co dimension one. Given by S equal Z zero Z N P of Z zero Z N equal zero. For a homogeneous polynomial, polynomial P of degree K greater equal than zero, then the canonical bundle to S it's simply O K minus N minus one restricted to S. And the proof is actually very easy now that we have a lot of hints, let's say. So recall that um, we had a formula for this, which was in true in general for every submanifold of co-dimension one. That the canonical bundle to the submanifold is the canonical bundle to the old manifold times the bundle associated to the Cartier divisor, all restricted to S. Okay? Uh, but now we know what this is like. We know that this is O of negative n plus 1. And then we have this tensor O S. To us. Okay, so what we're left with is to determine what is this OS, and the hope, I mean, what we expect from the theorem is that this should be O of K, right? So if it's O of K, we're done. And now we know, I mean, this is very similar to what we did uh, for the for showing that homogeneous polynomials are the sections of these bundles. Here also you have a one, yeah, the one in position beta. 
Um, so we're th simply thinking of each this p. So we know how to get from um, the sub manifold to the associated bundle. We have to find uh, what happens to p in the local trivialization and see what is the transitions for this. And the zeta beta over zeta alpha to the k, well, this is simply the transition functions for uh, OK. So the device S has transition functions z beta over z alpha to the k. And so O of S is simply O of k. OK, in this proof of the proposition. So this, this, uh, this uh, thing that we did now still does not prove uh, what you asked before. So it doesn't prove that all bundles, all, all, all line bundles over CPN are one of these line bundles. Because um, I think, yeah, before I, I mean, I just said it pretty fast and I'm not, I mean, I, I think I said something along the lines, or maybe I implied it, I didn't say it, that all bundles come from, um, all, all line bundles come from sub manifolds of codimension one. That, that is not true. That is not true. As we've seen here, for instance, you see, if you take a sub manifold of codimension one, uh, we get all these OKs for K positive, but we don't get the negative ones, right? So for that, we will need uh, something which is not, an, so you remember when we defined Cartier divisors, we actually called them effective Cartier divisors. Uh, there is another thing which is more general, which is like the general Cartier divisors and general Cartier divisors do what we want them to do. And just a tiny spot, we will deal with that. Um, it's a tiny spoiler. It basically corresponds to taking sub manifolds, but with a sign. So these submanifolds that we take here, we think of them as zeros of holomorphic functions. Uh, but then you can take submanifolds as poles of meromorphic functions. And this would be like negative submanifolds, and this gives rise to the other ones. But we will we'll deal with that when we get there. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think since I'm, on, I'm a bit sick, I'm pretty exhausted right now. Uh, so I think I want to end it here for today. It's also a good moment to stop. Okay, then, uh, so to say, one last question uh, regarding the Picard group. Um, so uh, the thing you just said, does that mean that we still uh, didn't prove that uh, the Picard group of um, CPN is Z, uh, as it could be something bigger? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We didn't so that was my original question. More yeah, or less. that was your original. That was what question. I was. No, I, we didn't prove it yet. I don't know if uh, we'll actually. It, it's definitely not something I had in my notes. Um, I, I know it's true. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hmm. I, I don't know if it's element, like once you have this tautological bundles, I don't know if from there it's like, yeah, sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Like if there is some easy observation, which I'm missing right now, it's definitely not an observation I had in my notes. So I don't know if it's because it was so easy that I didn't put it down. <laughs> or it was so hard that I didn't put it down. Uh, but we'll actually look it up. I'll let you know. <laughs>